Everybody glad you know the Lord here tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing like serving the Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing like it. Think about all of the people in this big old world and here you sit, having repented of your sins, been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. What was so special about us? It's just God saw us and said, I'm going to call out to him. And when he called out to us, we answered the call. I want you to know God is great. He is so awesome. He is so incredible. My goodness. Hallelujah, we are just a blessed people. Hallelujah, I want you to hope that you'll make up your mind this week to give that old devil fits, amen? We've got Brother Hughes going to be here Wednesday night. That's going to be awesome stuff. And then he'll be back with us Sunday night. And um, I want to encourage you folks to keep your eyes on the Gulf this week say it's looking like it's going to head over to Florida. I don't want to wish anything on anybody, but I, I just stay a little higher ground than we are here. So I'd rather not us have to get out the P-Rogues and float down the, the bayous. I'd rather us be able to just stay high and dry. How about you? So I, I'd encourage you to say a few, few prayers. Really, I, I just wish it back up. Get on back out in that ocean. Hallelujah. I told you many times about my dad praying that day. We were about to pour the slab on this, on this church building, and here comes the rain. I mean, it's the biggest, darkest cloud you've ever seen. And he said, come on, Michael, grab my hands. We're going to pray. And so we prayed, and that thing turned around and went the other way. And so, so we need to start. We need to. We need to grab somebody's hand and pray. Storm, go the other way. Whatever, whatever, Lord, you got to go the other way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Send that thing another way. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you folks to pray every single day. Find yourself a quiet place and just talk to the Lord. You don't have to say a whole lot if you'll just, you can say, hey, it's me. I'm here again, and I love you. And I want to talk. Just talk to him. Every single day, talk to him. Pick up your Bible every single day. Read you a chapter or two. But it's not enough just to read a chapter or two. You've got to understand what you're reading. Apply it to your life. Hallelujah. Maybe it'll instruct you on, on concerning somebody else that, that you know and love. Maybe it, it'll just open, the, open a little window into their lives and you'll know what to pray for. But um, read your Bible every day and just understand what God's got to say to you. And then pick you a day every week and, and uh, get, get this old body under subjection. Can we do that? Hallelujah. Reach over, join hands with your neighbor. Lord, I'm asking you to send forth those mighty, mighty angels, Lord. We're about to bring our tithe, our offering into the storehouse of the Lord. You, mighty God, are about to rebuke the devourer. Devourer, you've got to go. You are not welcome at First Pentecostal Church West Bank. We don't have to rebuke you with our tongues. We rebuke you by way of our actions. When we bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse of the Lord. The, the devourer's got to stand up and take notice. I want to speak blessing on God's people here tonight. Physical blessing, spiritual blessing, emotional blessing. Lord, even <laughs> financial blessing. Lord, let these things chase your people down. Hallelujah. We shouldn't have to chase those things. Those things are supposed to chase us. And I thank you, Lord, for hearing. I thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer today. Lord, you are good in Jesus' name. Get your tithing, your offering. Those of you that are watching online, you know how to give online. Do it right now. Praise the Lord.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, we find that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. The New Living Translation of Hebrews 6.18, of which I'm not a huge fan. I'll tell you why I'm not a huge fan of it in just a moment. But from the New Living Translation we find, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope or the expectation that lies before us. This hope, this expectation is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. The point here is this, God cannot lie it is impossible if he said it you can believe it yet there's a qualifier here you've got to hold up your end of the law for instance when God said ask and it shall be given seek and you shall find knock and the door shall be open to you your parts of the equation are you have to first ask in faith believing. You can't just say words. You've got to go to him believing that he's going to answer. But that's not all. You have to faithfully ask, faithfully seek, and faithfully knock. You say, well, I asked one time about half a year ago and nothing's happened yet. I've sought the Lord about two years ago and nothing yet. Well, you didn't stick with it. You didn't give your desire daily to the Lord. So I want to talk to you on this subject for a little bit here tonight. See if the Lord will help us. If God said it, you can believe it. God said it, you can believe it. Lord, help us tonight to receive your word with meekness so that it will become engrafted into our lives. Help us to come become more, Lord, than we were when we got to church tonight, Lord. Help us to keep this flesh down so that your spirit can have its way, its will within our lives. Pray these things in the authority and in the power of the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. Now, let me tell you why I'm really not a huge fan of most modern translations. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we find the Apostle Peter sharing, for the very first time, the God-given keys to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he gave us keys on how we could make heaven our home. When asked by the crowd that was gathered around outside the upper room, what shall we do? The King James Version reads like this, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And yet, the New Living Translation reads, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ 
for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to note this, church. The King James Version said remission of sins. The New Living says forgiveness of sins. My point is there is a huge difference between remission and forgiveness. Forgiveness is defined as an intentional intentional decision to let go of resentment and anger, while remission is defined as the cancellation of a debt, a charge, or a penalty. Friends, that, that's like daylight and dark. That's a whole different, that's a whole different world there. With forgiveness, there's always the memory of the debt. With remission, it's wiped away entirely. It's as though it was never there. It's purposely forgotten by God. Hebrews 8, 12 said it like this, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more? Hebrews 10, 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Jesus could forgive sins before the cross. In fact, he said to the thief on the cross, this day thy sins be forgiven thee. And yet it took Jesus' death, it took Jesus' burial, it took Jesus' resurrection to wipe away even the record of sins so they would never be remembered again. You see, only the, under the Old Testament law, there was the temporary. Sins were temporarily dealt with, yet each year more sacrifice had to be made because those past sins would come up before God's remembrance. While under the New Testament, Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice. His blood had permanency to it. So on the day of Pentecost, when Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, he was saying, when the blood of Jesus is applied to your life, when you go under that water in the name of Jesus Christ, you begin with a fresh slate, a brand new life. In the eyes of God, there is no past sin. There was no past sin to be remembered because all remembrance of it is gone. One might ask, but why do many of the new translation not make the new translations not make this distinction? Well, there's many reasons for this. But first and foremost, I'm going to give you a little quick lesson. Bible authenticity. First and foremost, there were 54 translators involved in the translation of the Holy Scriptures under King James. 54. And you know what their goal was? Agreement. We've got to agree. So there were 54 under King James. There were 15 translators under the New International Version. There were 12 translators under the New Living Version. Notice, we're losing major numbers in the consensus category. The truth is, many of these new translations have only one translator, which means there's only one person to agree with, me, myself, and I. Truth is, Jesus could forgive sins before the cross. Therefore, if all that was required was forgiveness, why did Jesus have to die? If all we needed was forgiveness, why in the world did Jesus have to go to that cross and face untold, I mean, untold agony to his body? He had to go so that our sins could be remitted, cast into the sea. Hallelujah, forgetfulness. Amen. Somebody say, thank the Lord for truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus had to die. He had to be buried. He had to be resurrected, resurrected, and now we sit in this apostolic church and we know beyond the shadow of a doubt 
that the blood has been applied to our lives. We've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. To get any of that to work, you've got to repent of your sins. And if the Lord comes back before this service is over, hallelujah, there's going to be a whole lot of empty pews around here. Amen. I just look at this old world today and I say to myself over and over again, I, Lord, I don't see how you can, I don't, I don't see how you can delay your coming much longer. This is a wicked, wicked world in which we're living. I mean, and so, friends, we got to be ready, all right? Now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, and we're going to get on really with what I came to talk to you about tonight. I don't know why I felt like I needed to throw that in, but I wanted to. So here we go. Now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God which passeth by us continually. So let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. It fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and he lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto her, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all of this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the king of the host? And, and she answered, I dwell among mine own people. In other words, this, this hadn't been about us. This has been about you. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. Do we realize here tonight doesn't matter how things appear to be in this whole world, God simply cannot lie. It is an impossibility. Men lie, Satan lies, his wicked spirits lie, but not your God. If God commits something to you, he, he plans on seeing it through. You might not see your part of it through, but he's going to see his part of it through. In fact, Titus 1-2 tells us in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, there it is again, promised before the world began. The point being, again, if God has told you something, if God has said it, you might as well go ahead and grab hold and just believe it until you literally see it come to pass. Let me give you a few of God's promises here this evening. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In other words, if husband and wife do their part to teach, to over and over and over again train their children Bible truths, that training will be with that child all through his or her life. I'm telling you, it will be with them every time they're about to step into a forbidden place. Something will, will check within their hearts, and they'll say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be here because that teaching will not turn them loose. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. God himself in 2 Chronicles seven thirteen said, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, 
or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be opened and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. You tell me, do you think prayer's just a little bit important? I think prayer is an essential thing that each and, of, each and every one of us need to be involved in. And I'm not just talking about saying words. I'm talking about connecting with God, having relationship with him, letting him know how very much you love him. And I'll tell you what, you tell him that very much, and he's going to start telling you, and I love you too, son. I love you too, daughter. You're mine. Hallelujah. I claim you. It's time for us to begin saying, Lord, I claim you too. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you thanks. I'll let you know how valuable an entity you are in my life. Friends, God has got to become the most important thing in our worlds. We live in a carnal, wicked world today. We live in a world that is consumed with me it's consumed with with we ourselves and and it doesn't look outward and and say well god how do you feel about these things god's wanting us to become the church that that he desires his people to be god is wanting each and every one of us to become i'm talking about transmitters of him into others lives and how do you say how do we do that by shining a light for the world to see so that people understand that there's something different about us. Well, amen, glory to God, hallelujah. The point here tonight, church, is if we'll do our part, God will without question do his. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's look again at the promise found in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter Begin sharing the gospel and he said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call Hallelujah. If you're a parent and your children aren't serving the Lord, you need to hold that up each and every day of your life. God made a promise to us. He made a promise to our children. And I'm telling you what that promise is. That promise is I'm going to call, I'm going to call your children out of this world. I'm going to remind your children that I still care about them and that I'm reaching for them. Don't you ever forget that, that God has you on his heart, and he also has your children on his heart. I really want you to understand this, church. If we give ourselves to repentance, if we turn from sin, if we're baptized in the name of Jesus, we're going to receive God's greatest gift, and I just believe this with all of my heart, Lost children are going to receive it too. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you for everyone. Hallelujah, everyone. There's not just a select few, but, few, but everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. But again, this is one of those instances where we've got to ask today and tomorrow we're going to be at it, back at it again, asking again tomorrow. You say, well, I asked yesterday. God already knows what I want. So why in the world are we having to ask regularly? Well, sometimes we're asking for the wrong reasons. 
We're asking for things for the wrong reason. Might be that the enemies warring against our petition's arrival. Might even be that what we're asking for isn't the will of God. So God has to keep working on us until what we're asking for is moderated to conform to God's will. You say, well, I want what I want. Well, maybe God doesn't want you to have it just like you want to have it. Maybe God's got another plan for that thing's arrival. So sometimes he's got to work on us. We're asking daily and we're seeking daily and we're knocking daily. And God says, when you start asking for the right reasons, when you start asking the right way, then I will give you that thing that you've, that you've asked me for. I'm telling you, God has a will, folks. It's not just about what we want, but God has a will. It's, it's also about what does God want? What does God have to, what does God think about it? I'll say it again. If God said it, you can believe it. But you're first of all, you've got to begin believing it yourself. Because everything from God is contingent on faith in his promises. When I think about people receiving great promises from God, I always think about that little widow woman and her son. Most will remember the widow woman was out gathering sticks to cook her meals, her family's last meal. They were then going to eat their meal, sit down, and then from that point on, they were just going to starve to death. The count said there was only a handful of meal in the barrel, tiny bit of oil in the cruise. But even with the little they had, here comes the man of God. And I want you to listen to what he said to these two, that I'm telling you they are at the end of the rope. They, there's not even any room to tie a knot in it and hang on. I mean, they are truly at the end of their rope. And here comes that man of God, and he's saying, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So let's think about it. They're in starvation mode, and yet the prophet comes along saying, feed me first. Her response was, we don't have much. But he continued on, if you feed me first, if you'll put God first, then you and your son will reap a great and lasting benefit. She obeyed, and from that point on, God supplied what they needed you see if God said it you can believe it friends I hear people from time to time say but brother Sarton I, I just can't tithe if I do I won't have enough to do what I want to do I can't give offerings there won't be enough for me now don't you dare get tight on me here right now hallelujah people try to rationalize they try to figure it out they get out the slide rule. They get out the pen and paper trying to see if they can make what God said work in their natural worlds. Friends, what we need to understand is this. If God said it, we can believe it. Because again, God cannot, I said he cannot, one more time, he cannot lie. I mean, what would many have called Elijah on that day, if they'd been sitting on the sidelines and watching, I believe many would have said, my goodness, that stinking money-hungry preacher. Why do you think you're doing taking food out of a mother and son's mouth? I mean, I knew it all along, Elijah. All you preachers are the same. All you're after is my money. All you're after is my paycheck. I want to ask this congregation a question this evening. Don't raise your hands. Don't answer me, but answer you. How many of you are tithing and giving your offering? 
With this in mind, now answer this question to yourself. Has God always taken care of you? You say, well, Brother Sartre, I've had a few rocky roads. My Lord, if you didn't have a few rocky roads, you wouldn't know how to appreciate those, those even keel roads. Sometimes the reason we have rocky roads is God's teaching us a lesson. Hey, if you can learn the lesson here, then I'll be able to bless you exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. Well, somebody say amen. So again, I ask, has God always taken care of you? Has God always met your need? Let me tell you why he does these things. It's because, let's put it this way, most of the time it's because you baked him a cake first. It wasn't about you, it was about him. And I've never seen it fail that when you make it about God, God makes it about you. Again, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Friends, if we are givers, not even, I'm not even talking about tithes and offerings now. We could be talking about any area of our lives. If we are givers, really givers, it's amazing how God turns every bit of that around and sends it back our way and says, you're not going to outgive me. I'm telling you, that's God's mindset. You're not going to get out give me. When you first started doing tithes and offerings, you may have said, I don't know how in the world this is going to work. How in the world am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to, how am I going to put food on my table? How am I going to take a vacation this year? Yet in doing what you're supposed to do, you've come to realize that little is much when God is in it you see friends if God said it I promise you you can believe it how many of us have had God answered prayers for us in the past I remember some of us went through a storm several years ago and we looked at it as a curse maybe it was a curse but, uh, you know, I look at people in this church, Jeff and Lauren, y'all got, got so much more than you had before. When God was done, I mean, my goodness, what a spectacular home y'all have now. God knew that house needed a fix-up. He just knew that house needed some help. And so he sent out a little blessing. He sent out a little blessing. I'm going to tell you what, you've just never seen it fail. When you put God first, God always turns that around and he begins blessing you back. Well, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You say, well, Brother Sarton, I've prayed for lost loved ones. Uh, maybe you've been praying for somebody that you know that's sick in body. Perhaps you prayed for a job situation, a house situation, a family situation, a friend situation. I'll say it again. If God said it, you can count on it. You can believe it. And friends, if God has promised you something, if you've been reading along in the Word and the Lord has quickened a word to you, you can count on it. God is speaking into your spirit. So you just need to stand up and say, Thank you, Lord, for singling me out and giving me direction. Hallelujah! 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 Sometimes we go through tight seasons, and you say, well, why is that? Sometimes God's testing us. Will you still honor me in the lean seasons as you honored me in the, in the fat seasons? Are you going to honor me in spite of what's going on in your life? I'll tell you what, if you honor God... God's going to take care of you. Hallelujah. I'll say it again. If God said it, you can believe it. I'm reminded here about the prophet Elisha who asked Elijah, his mentor, for a double portion of his anointing. Elijah said, friends, you've asked a mighty hard thing. <laughs> I kind of picture Elijah saying, man, some mighty things have happened in my life. I don't know if you got it in you, big boy. And... Um, 
you've asked a mighty hard thing here, and, um, and yet if you see me when God takes me, God's going to give you that double portion. And yet we read the word and we find out that Elijah had seven miracles in his ministry, and yet at death, Elisha, he only had 13. Surely God failed him. Sometimes we get the feeling just like that. God, you let me down. God, you did. I mean, my goodness, if I'd have been Elisha, I, I, I'd have been saying, I mean, if I'd have been anybody, I'd have been saying, my Lord, 13 miracles? That's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's outstanding. I mean, Elijah was something special, but this Elisha, He's something over, he's just over the moon. And so, I mean, you, you think about it. Surely God, I mean, surely some would said, God has failed this man. And yet it wasn't the case. 2 Kings 13, 20, we've read this many times. Elisha died, they buried him, and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. Came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of men they cast the dead man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Again, I say, God cannot lie. It is impossible. Hallelujah. Elisha said, uh, Elijah said, you're going to get a double portion. And it was fulfilled. Just like he said. Look at the church of today. Jesus said, I'll be back for you shortly. And yet here we are 2,000 years later and still know Jesus. Did Jesus lie? Of course not. It's this. The Lord thinks differently than we do. For instance, hallelujah. What is a day... Some, some little something in there about a day, a, a thousand years to us is, is a day to the Lord. I mean, so we just, we're on different levels. We're on different, we're on, we're on different planes here. Look at Joseph. He receives a dream that his brothers would bow down to him. Instead of bowing down to him, they slail him into slavery. Temptation comes Joseph's way. He flees, and now he finds himself in jail for something that he never did. For years he's in a prison house until the king has a dream that cannot be interpreted. The king's then told there's a jailbird. He's locked up in the jailhouse. He can tell you exactly what you need to hear. And when it was all said and done, Joseph becomes second in command. Of the food. I mean, he's over the food. He's over. Man, that's what people want. They want the food. Amen. So he, he was something special. Understand this, church. If God said it, you can count on it. So just hang in there. Just don't whine, don't complain. Just say, God, I'm trusting you. Every day when you wake up, God, I'm going to trust you for the day. Tomorrow when you wake up, I'm trusting you for tomorrow, God. When the next day rolls around, God, I'm trusting you for the day. Hallelujah. I'm not going to turn loose of your promises. You've said it, and it's going to be mine. 2 Corinthians 1.19 said it like this, For the Son of God... Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him it was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen, and to the glory of God by us. Think about Paul, what he said to Abraham. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Man, what a mighty man of faith. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what had promised, what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness point being Abraham's faith was so strong that his faith indicated the strength of his righteousness 
I just want to encourage somebody tonight. You know, if you feel like God's not giving you the things that you've asked for just yet, just hang in there. Remember Brother Abraham. They had to wait a while. But when that child finally came, they knew that God had given them the desire of their heart. How about that little widow woman? I want to remind you about her. The prophet said the meal will last, the oil will stay. What's God saying to you? Do you believe what God's told you? If God gave you a promise, you can count on it. It will come to pass. So just hang in there, dig your heels in, make up your mind. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I'm going to trust him in spite of what it looks like. In spite of what hell has brought my way. In spite of things that were unexpected. In spite of problems, worries, fears, stress. I'm just going to trust you, God. Because you said it. And Lord, when you speak, mighty things happen. Hallelujah. Mighty things happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Anybody got a need here tonight? Anybody got a need here tonight? If you got a need, just slip your hand up. Got a need. Got a need. Hallelujah. 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 Why don't you just close your eyes right now and I'm going to ask the people to praise the Lord, and I want you just to remind the Lord about that thing that you need right now. Come on, folks, let's just love the Lord, and these people are going to remind the Lord about what they need. Come on, come on, hallelujah. That's it, that's it. That's it, just remind the Lord. Lord, I just want to remind you, this is what I need. This is what I'm desiring you to do. Lord, this is what I'm longing for, God. This is the main thing, Lord, on my need meter, God. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I've got to have it, Lord. And, Lord, I'm still trusting you for it, God. I'm not turning loose of your promises. You said it, God. I believe it. I'm going to hang on to it, Lord, until I see it, Lord. I'm going to hang on to it, and when I see it, Lord, I'm going to I'm going to lift up my thanksgiving to you, Lord. I might even dance before you, Lord, with all of my might. Hallelujah. I close with a final scripture here tonight. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for or expected. Faith is (laughs) the evidence of things not seen. (laughs) I'm not seeing anything yet, Brother Sark. Have you got any faith? Have you got any faith? Let me read it again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, expected. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. For by it, for by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I I was reading yesterday about this little object that's going to come kind of close to earth. And it's supposed to be here for 54 days. Anybody heard about that little second moon that they're talking about? My Lord, you guys don't don't check the news out very much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not going to come so close to the earth that's going to cause problems, but they call it the second moon. And that thing is right where it's supposed to be, right at this time. We don't see any planet killers coming close to the earth. The Lord's going to get us out of here before anything like that occurs, so just relax. What I'm saying to you is everything is as it's supposed to be. This world, it moves as it's supposed to move. It's held together by God. 
God's power, God's might. You don't see what's holding things together, but it's, but it's God's power. That's, how in the world can people be atheists? How in the world could all that is happening in, in this universe, in our world, how could people not understand that there's a God? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. In other words, old brother Abel is still testifying about his faith and his connection to God. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh, friends, if you've got a, t- if you've got a need in your life, this ought to be it. Lord, I need to be pleasing to you, God. I want to be pleasing to you, God. I want to bring joy to you, God. I want to bring pleasure to you, Lord. Ha! Let me read that again. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he moved with fear. Never seen rain before, but God said, you got to build an ark, and this is the way it's to be built. And he started building, prepared an ark, And in preparing that ark, his house was saved by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Friends, we need to pray this prayer every day. Lord, increase, increase, increase my faith. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he Now, that's faith. If I'm over in New Orleans, I know where I'm going to get back to my house. He didn't know where he was going. He just said, God said, get away from your family. They're a bunch of idolaters. Get away from them. I don't want you, who's going to be the father of the faithful, to be caught up in idolatry. And you know what? He just left. He got out of there. You know what I find in each of these examples I've just named? I find action. God spoke to Noah and he got busy. God spoke to Abraham. I feel the Holy Ghost here. And he got busy. None of them were sitting around just waiting. No, they were willing to do. And God did something with their willingness. What do you need God to do for you? What do you need God to do for you? My my imploring tonight is this. Get to asking. And don't stop asking until you receive. Hallelujah. Lord, increase our faith tonight, Lord. We live in this old world that works overtime to steal our faith. But we are your people, God, and we trust you. We know you've got us in the palms of your hands. You order our steps. Lord, as long as we stay submitted, Lord, Lord, you make our way your way. You grab hold of our feet and you put them where they're supposed to go. Again, Lord, you order our steps, and I'm so thankful that you care enough about us to do these things. God, if I get to head in the wrong way, you'll, you'll get my attention some way, shape, form. God, you're going 
You're going to get a hold of my thoughts, God. And you're going to lead me back in those paths of righteousness. So, Lord, I'm asking you to increase our faith, Lord, over the days to come. Increase our faith. I wish somebody would say that with me right now. Lord, increase my faith. Grow my faith, Lord. Build my faith, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, build my faith, Lord, to the place, Lord, where I know, God, beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are working miracles, Lord, whether I can see them, whether I can feel them, whether I'm experiencing them or not. Lord, hallelujah, increase our faith, Lord. Grow our faith, God. Build our faith, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let it happen. Why don't you just reach over and grab somebody's hands and pray together with them. Lord, increase our faith, Lord. Increase our faith. Grow our faith, Lord. Build our faith, God. Lord, I trust you, God. I lean on you faithfully, God. You never fail me, not one time. You never will, God. You love me in spite of myself, God. So often I get in your way, God, but, but you just... You get my attention, Lord, and I step back and I say, wait a minute, I'm doing this wrong. So, Lord, I, 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 I want to take that faith walk, God. I want to believe. I want to trust as I should, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Now, I pray for these, your people, God, before we leave this evening. I pray, in Lord, in the days to come that you'll order our steps. That you'll make our way perfect, God. Lord, I want you to call us to prayer. Don't leave it to us, Lord. Call us to prayer. Lord, call us to that secret place. And Lord, when you call, I make a commitment, Lord, that when you call, I'm going to go. I'm going I'm to stop what I'm doing, and I'm going to find that secret place, and I'm going to talk to you. And Lord, as I talk to you, my faith is going to grow trust is going to grow and I'm going to see your hand begin to move in mighty ways. Lord, I pray these things in the authority and in the power of the name of the Lord Jesus. And everybody in the house said, Amen. You believe it? Hallelujah. You believe it? Praise the Lord. I love every single one of you. I'll see you back Wednesday night. We got a special speaker Wednesday night, don't forget.